Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. And we give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield, Clark County area, or looking for new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. I had the 8 o'clock service. Marty made a little pep talk pitch for the upcoming Yule time, uh, but he didn't appoint anybody for this service, so I guess I'm the good one that's supposed to do it. So just a reminder, Yule time this week, uh, please support us. Uh, if you have items for the auction, please bring them in uh, by Wednesday. Uh, also invite your neighbors and friends and let everybody know about Yule time and bring them in so they can see what we do here uh, as a congregation. So again, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, our annual Yule Tide Festival. Uh, please join us and support. Let us now prepare for worship with the order of confession and forgiveness on page 94 in the front of our worship. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're opening our service with this first hymn written by Isaac Watts. It was written in 1719. He wrote a hymn about every single psalm. And this is the psalm, Jesus shall reign where heir of the sun. It stimulated Eric Lydell, a famous Scottish missionary, to go abroad. He was a star in the Olympic Games in Paris. And then he went abroad to spread the message of Jesus. 1719, this hymn was written and is appropriate for today. Jesus shall reign where the sun.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. reading the scripture for today. This is the 15th of November, 2015, 25th Sunday after Pentecost. At that time, Michael, the great priest, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. And I see God. singing Psalm 16 responsively.
until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their heart, and I will write them on their mind. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean for an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're now singing the gospel acclamations. Our pastor, Pastor John Pollock, is reading the gospel to us from the elevated pulpit. We're standing to show our great respect for the gospel. As we know, Jesus is here. Jesus is our brother. And he will be with us forever. He gives us eternal life. presenting special music. The director is Vicki Perks.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What will happen in the future? Almost every person on earth has an interest in what the future might hold. We know that from the fact that every year there's a several million dollar industry of people having lines, uh, phone numbers that you can call up and they will tell you your future or you can go and have your palm read or go have a person look at a crystal ball and tell you what your future is going to be. And then there's a big industry in publishing the horoscope and letting you see what sign you're born under. What does it say your future is going to be? And the same is everything we are involved in in life. We take a new job. We wonder what will be the, my future in this new job. Or we move to a new area, a new city, town, state. What will my future be like here? Will this be a, a better future than where we formerly lived? Or if you have uh, a diagnosis and the doctor tells you you have something, then you're wondering, well, what is my future entail? What is it going to happen? Or am I going to overcome this? Or is this affliction going to get the better of me. And one area where people are always wondering about is the future of the world and when will it come to an end. So we have religious fanatics who will take a verse out of context of the Bible and they will tell us that they know exactly when the world is coming to an end. We've seen it time and time again. Somebody claiming Jesus is coming on this and this date because I figured it out. Well, they're always wrong. How many times have we heard somebody say the end of the world's coming and it's still here? Well, Jesus addresses this in our gospel lesson and turning through that 13th chapter of the gospel of Mark, we can see what Jesus says concerning what will happen. That is what will happen as far as he will let us know. And so let us go back to that 13th chapter. And actually I would encourage you instead of looking at the today's reading insert to pull out the Bible in your pew if you don't have your own Bible with you because I'm gonna read uh, some more verses that in the old lectionary we used to read all the way to verse 13. For some reason in the new one they cut it off at verse eight. But to fully understand we have to read all 13 verses. So as we begin this 13th chapter, it's Holy Week, Jesus' last week on earth as Son of God and Son of Man. He's facing the cross. He's facing betrayal. They've been in Jerusalem and they come out of the city and one of the disciples point out the temple and the wonderful stones and how beautiful it is. And Jesus replies to him and says, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. There will not remain, that's the word left literally means, there will not be one stone remain here upon another, for they all will be demolished, destroyed. That's what the word thrown down literally means. So here Jesus is predicting destruction. What destruction is he predicting? He is predicting the destruction of the temple. The exact temple that they just left, the exact temple that they are looking at, he is telling them it's going to be destroyed. And in 70 AD, this became a reality. In 70 AD, the Roman legions under Titus, who would later succeed his father Vespasian as emperor of Rome, legions, legions, besieges Jerusalem, conquers it, tears down the walls, tears down the temple, so that one stone was not left upon another. You go to Israel today, the only thing there is the foundation. And part of that foundation is sacred to the Jews. It's called the Wailing Wall. And they go there to pray because they have no temple to go to anymore. But as Jesus said, the temple itself, the structure, was all gone. Everything had been torn down. Now some years later, or it might even have been a century later, there was a Roman emperor who found out about this prophecy of Jesus, and he wanted to prove him wrong. So he decided he was going to rebuild the temple. So he started to rebuild the temple. An earthquake came and destroyed the, destruction, the construction. Try the second time. 
Start building, rebuilding the temple. A fire came, burned up everything they had constructed. Try a third time, another earthquake. A fourth time, another fire. A fifth time, an earthquake and a fire. On the fifth time, he realized his attempts were few. That the word of Jesus Christ could not be disproved. That when Jesus had predicted that this would happen, he was correct. And it happened. So that moment, those words that Jesus was talking about, he was talking about something that took place while many of the apostles there were still alive. Or some of them would have been alive. Peter and St. Or St. Peter would already have been crucified. There were some who were still living. Many of his followers went through that Roman besieging of Jerusalem and the destruction afterwards. Then he says in verses 7 and 8, he tells us that there is going to be pandemonium among nations. But this is nothing to be worried about. In the sense of whether or not it means the end times. He says, and when you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. It literally means do not be disturbed, do not be terrified, don't let it bother you. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are all but the beginning of the birth of famine. These are all the beginning of intolerable anguish. So he's telling us there will be wars and rumors of wars, but do not panic. Because this is just part of the world. Now every time a war breaks out, there's someone who tries to say, this is it. Uh, Jesus is coming. And they try to take that verse out of the Bible and assign it to modern day persons or or modern day nation that say, see, this is what the Bible said. I can remember when I was in college, and it was in college in Lexington, I was allowed to come home once a semester. That was it. I none of this coming home every weekend like a lot of college kids. My parents said, you need to go off and learn how to be on your own, live by yourself. And my mom taught me how to iron and do laundry, so I was set. Uh, didn't teach me how to cook, but at least I knew how to keep my clothes clean. <laughs> so this was the one weekend for that semester. It was in the spring. Uh, and I was waiting at the Greyhound bus station. And this guy comes up to me with his wild look and says, Say, can you believe Jesus is coming? Says, the end of the world. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, haven't you been paying attention to the news? Uh, all the turmoil in the Middle East, Israel, and Egypt are getting ready to go to war together. And I said, uh-huh. He said, yeah, it's the end of the world. Aren't you afraid? I said, are we supposed to be afraid? I said, aren't we supposed to be looking forward to Jesus returning? I said, if he's coming, I'm all for it. Save me a bus trip. Back to the <laughs> Of course, Jesus didn't come. Spent the weekend at home, went back to Transylvania, Sunday night. But Jesus is telling us not to get caught up in this, that we live in a sinful world, and in a sinful world, there are going to be conflicts, there are going to be wars, there are going to be disputes, there's going to be all kinds of uh, tribulation, and no matter how much you may want peace, you're never going to have it. Because there's sinful people. And someone is always going to take advantage of somebody else. Think about your history. World War I, the war to end all wars. The nations involved gathered in Versailles to make a peace treaty, thinking that they would now be able to legislate a peaceful world so that there would never be a war again, especially nothing like what they had. And so they made their peace treaty. And in making that peace treaty, things kind of got turned upside down and, and misconstrued. They end up putting all the blame on Germany for the war, which was not right. The war started because a Serbian nationalist assassinated the heir to the throne of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, the Archduke Ferdinand. But they blamed it all on Germany, stole land from Germany that was rightfully theirs and gave it to France and other places. Poland became a free country. Uh, 
They told the Germans they couldn't have a military or strip their way down, thinking Germany was the only nation they had to worry about. They had no idea. That one of the allies in World War I, Italy, would go through a collapsed government and have rise the power of journalists who had been in World War I, who once obtaining power became a dictator and declared that Italy was going to be the new Rome. And he was going to make the new Roman Empire, Benito Mussolini. And so his big ideas of grandeur began by not attacking one of the European nations. He crosses the Mediterranean and picks on poor little Ethiopia, a nation that hardly had any 20th century weaponry, trying to fight the Italians on horseback and camel with guns from the 17th century and the like. And so here were the beginnings of another conflict. Another signer of the treaty and a member of the League of Nations, Japan, at this time begins to cast its eye on Asia. And it becomes militaristic and decides that Asia was for the Asians. And that Japan was the greatest of Asians, therefore they should rule. China, Vietnam, Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, the islands of the Pacific, the whole Asian region should be under the control of the Empire of Japan. And so they invade Manchuria. And all the while, war to end all wars, two allies are being aggressive, and all that idealism is shattered within Germany. A corporal from World War I, given an iron cross for having survived a mustard gas attack and for other heroics, is elected chancellor or appointed chancellor of the German nation and launches Germany into the period of Nazism and the war to end all wars becomes a distant memory as this time the entire world is involved. In the 60s, young people on college campuses, and not just on college campuses, some young people just left home and especially went out to Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, thought that they could bring peace by dropping out of the regular lifestyle, by seeing, give peace a chance, growing their hair long, wearing bare bottoms, not taking a bath every day, living in commune. They were going to make a new world where there was nothing but peace. We saw how well that worked out. How many communes end up being uh, nothing more than a place where one person rolls to the top and bullied everybody else. We saw where no matter how much you may want to believe that just give peace a chance, everything will work out, there's always somebody being aggressive. And so, what did we see? World War II, and this is just America, what we are involved in, and other nations, and Africans, South America, and Central America, and Asia, and so forth, were involved in their own conflicts. But we had the Korean War after World War II, then we had Vietnam, then we had Grenada, then we had Desert Storm, then we had the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. We live in an imperfect world. Jesus said, there would be wars and rumors of wars, but it's not the end of the world yet. It's just a natural process of a sinful people in a world filled with sin due to that sin of our first parents that ended paradise. And then he gives us a third prediction of what will have take place. And this is where verses 9 through 13 are important. He tells us the church will be persecuted. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them, and the gospel must first be proclaimed or preached to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, 
but the Holy Spirit. We see this happen immediately after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Paul and, or John and Peter are called before the Sanhedrin and imprisoned. Stephen is stoned. Peter is stoned in prison again. We see, read that Christians were persecuted. Saul, a Pharisee, goes to Damascus to round up more Christians and bring them back to be tried before the Sanhedrin. Struck down by Jesus, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and becomes Paul the Apostle, who ends up being jailed many times and beaten and eventually martyred for the faith. So Jesus said, well, that would happen to the early church. And then we read verses 12 and 13 about what has happened ever since Charlotte, Constantine the Great made Christianity the faith of the Roman Empire. Ever since then, we read, and brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father and his child and children will rise against parents and have him put to death, and he will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The church continues to be persecuted throughout the world. Under Nazism and Communism, children were encouraged to turn in their parents for being Christian. They were encouraged to turn in their parents if they said anything against the leader. It still goes on in North Korea and other dictatorships. Those who were Christian continued to practice their faith under Communism, were often subject to imprisonment, to loot, being stripped of everything they had, losing their job. When the Iron Curtain fell, we heard of the brutality uh, done to Christians in Albania, and Romania, East Germany, other places behind the Iron Curtain. Today, we are still hated. Hated by the world because the world wants to act out of desire, out of impulse, act on the flesh. They don't want to hear the message of love, forgiveness, and salvation through Jesus Christ. And so we are persecuted, but the end is not yet. When Jesus was asked when he was going to come again, he said, it's not for you or me to know, but only my Father in heaven. He will decide. And as St. Peter tells us to God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So we should not be shocked that we are hated. We should not be shocked that we're persecuted. Now, that doesn't mean we sit back and, and let a scourge like ISIS just run wild, slaughtering Christians right and left. We are called to defend our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we shouldn't look at it like, oh, this is the end of the world, so we just throw up our hands and wait for Jesus to come. When Jesus comes, when he returns, we want him to catch us still laboring in the harvest. We want him to find us still doing his work. Still spreading the good news of the gospel to the end church. To still clothe the naked, feed the hungry, give that glass of cold water to the thirsty. To visit the sick and in prison. We want Jesus to catch us at work, not asleep. When John Kennedy was running for president in 1960, he oftentimes would end his speeches by telling about a speaker of the House of the State of Connecticut in the early days of our nation after it had become the United States of America after the 13 colonies had approved the Constitution and still live under uh, after several new states had been added so there were now 15 states instead of 13. And it says how one day in the legislature was meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, and as they looked out the windows, the sky became an ominous black. And many of the legislators began to panic and quarrel with themselves and demand that there be a German immediately. Colonel Davenport, Speaker of the House, stood up and he said, whether it is the end of time or not, I do not know. But what I do know is that if it is not the end of time, 
then we have nothing to worry about and no reason to adjourn. But if it is the end of time, I want to be found doing my duty. So bring more candles so we may continue to work. Of course, the point of that is that we not allow ourselves to be panicked by things we cannot control, but to continue to do our duty. And what is our duty? Our duty is to our Lord Jesus Christ to fulfill the Great Commission. Our duty to our Lord Jesus Christ is to be that little Christ unto our name. Our duty is to continue to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that every village, every hamlet, every town, every atoll, every island, every isthmus may hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so there will be wars and there will be rumors of war. And Christians will continue to be persecuted throughout the world. But we do not look up to see if Jesus is coming, but instead continue to labor in anger. Continue to do that will of our Lord. Oftentimes, in a ball game, a team that's ahead will suddenly stop playing like they were playing. And instead of continuing to play to win, they play not to lose. They keep looking at the clock. And so the team that's been behind suddenly catches up with them and ends up beating them because they totally got out of the rhythm and they can't recapture that. Jesus doesn't want us looking at the sky. He doesn't want us sitting back and just saying, sweet by and by, come and take it. He wants us to be his laborers in the field. He wants to return and find us working for his kingdom. And so let us not be worried. Let us tune out the fanatics who say, oh, Jesus is coming today. Or, Jesus is coming on February 25th. Jesus is coming on Easter 2016. They do not know any more than you know when Jesus is coming. So instead, let us keep focus on that great commission. Let us keep focus on spreading the good news of Jesus so that when he does come, or when we leave this earth, we hear Jesus say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the place prepared for you since the beginning of time. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now confessing our beliefs in the Nicene Creed, and we will have Holy Communion today. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light, to God, to God, be God in my name, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was informed by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified on the cross of Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, we come as those whose names you have written on your book of life to call upon your mercy for this day. Sustain us for the last gas of Satan's power, lest we deliver our bodies to sin and our hearts to unbelief. Make us to shine with the brightness of Christ's light in our world of darkness, fear and death. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. <laughs> Merciful Lord, we pray for your church and all of them who minister to your word. Keep us from false prophets who would deceive us and make us wise in your word. That we may discern their errors and make their words against them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Gracious God, we pray for those whose face has grown cold who have grown weary of the good fight of faith and have fallen away from our life together in your word. Renew their faith, restore them through repentance and absolution, and grant to us the will and courage to speak the truth to them in love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, we are surrounded by voices of hate, and sound and violence. Bring peace in troubled world. Bring to nothing the plots of those who plan those who would oppress and destroy. Guide the leaders of our nations and the all nations who work together for the common good. Bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they may act in accordance with your eternal will and desire. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, to whom we all those depart in faith. We pray for those suffering grief and mourning loss, especially those in France. Sustain them through their pain. Comfort them with the hope of the resurrection and grant them a steadfast face and joyful hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Kind Father, to your unfailing love we command all your servants who are afflicted and distressed in body, soul, and mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Blessed Lord, we long for the day that the good fight of faith is over, and you have brought to completion the fulfillment of your kingdom. Until that day, grant us courage to stand firm in faith before the world, to witness faithfully to those around us, and to resist temptation of bitterness and desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all to whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <laughs> we just heard Harvey Baker. Prayers of intercession. He's the communion assistant to our pastor, Pastor John Pollock. We now have uh, Nelson Smith, Linda Smith, who are our ushers, They're receiving the offering plates. We'll pass the offering plates among the people in the congregation, then we'll bring them forward as we present them to God. Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are, we are worshiping now today. At the 1030 service, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. You have heard the order of confession and forgiveness. The opening hymn was Jesus Shall Reign, was written by Isaac Watts, and it uh, inspired Eric Lydell to bring the gospel to China. We are inspired by music, we're inspired by the scripture, we're inspired by the holy word, we're inspired by the preaching. All of these things God asks us to do and helps us as we repent, believe, love God, and love one another. We've heard the Kyrie, the hymn of praise, glory to God, the prayer of the day, the first reading from Daniel, the Psalm, Psalm 16, the second reading from Hebrews, the Gospel acclamation, the Holy Gospel from Mark, and we had the special music from the choir, sermon, What Will Happen? 
Nobody knows what will happen, but we know that we believe, we trust, and God is in control. We do, do not need to be afraid. Now we have the offering coming forward, and we'll have the offertory prayer, the great thanksgiving, the song just the holy, 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 when all the people who have gone before us will be gathered around the altar. We'll all be here together. Jesus promises us eternal life. We receive his body and blood. He's made this for us, and it's a great gift. And all we have to do is receive it. We invite you to come and receive it too. 8 o'clock, 10.30, services every Sunday. We'll have the Eucharistic prayer, the Lord's prayer, the Lamb of God, which is Agnes Dei, distribution and blessing, post-communion prayer, the benediction, and the closing hymn will be on our way rejoicing. So stay tuned, continue to listen, and receive the power of the Holy Spirit.
His glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of His coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we, and all who share in the body and blood of Christ, may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the honor and glory of your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. St. John's Lutheran Church and receiving the Holy Spirit, eternal life, true body and blood of Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. By your word and sacraments, O oh God, you gave us a foretaste of a new heaven and a new earth that will be ours forever. Strengthen us in this vision that we might draw others to believe in the hope that is ours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Conclude your celebration with honor way rejoicing, hymn number 537 in the back of your worship. Hymn number 537. Our final hymn is On Our Way Rejoicing. It was written by John Munsell, but the music is by Francis Havergal, one of the most beloved hymn writers in English history. Isaac Watts and Francis Havergal. We have had two of their hymns today. They're very devout, very joyful hymns. This is Francis Havergal's hymn, On Our Way Rejoicing. Sing it along with us. Receive the joy of Jesus Christ. We want to announce that our flowers today, given for Joanne Smith in honor of her mother's birthday, and also the flowers are gift of a anonymous person for the glory of God. This is On Our Way Rejoicing, Francis Havergal. This is the 1800s. Beautiful, beautiful hymn. St. John Luther Church, Springfield, Ohio. watching St. John's on YouTube. Tune in anytime. It's easy to do. Just look on Google. Type in St. John's Lutheran Church just like you did today. Springfield, Ohio and you click on any service that you want. Please use this as a tool of evangelism. Take it out to other people. Show them how to listen to our service. You can worship God. You can receive God. You can receive the gift of eternal life forever and ever. You can share the love of Christ with others. This is very appropriate for today as we are suffering from terrorist attacks in Paris, France. But God is with us. We need not be afraid. Jesus is here. He will fill the world with love. We're happy to bring you this service. We offer a Christian school, ages 3, 4, nursery, pre-K. So call our church office for the Christian school information. That is 325-4311. Join us for our Yuletide Festival this week. I hope and I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day and all your days. We will pray for you. Continue to pray for us. 
pray for our YouTube ministry, pray for our world. Be willing to repent, love God, love your neighbor. Jesus Christ is with us, he gives us eternal life. He has conquered death, there's no death. It's just eternal life, forever and ever. So come with us and worship with us. The best people in Clark County are here. Christ is with us, God is with us, and we are doing his work. Come and help us. St. John's Yuletide Festival starts this Thursday, November 19th through Saturday, November 21st. Uh, lunches are served at the festival Thursday and Friday from 11 to 1 p.m. Dinners Thursday and Friday served at 5.30 to 7 p.m. Our live auction is Friday at 6.30 p.m. A silent auction and raffle Thursday through Saturday. Breakfast with Santa Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Meal tickets are on sale now and will be sold at the door. Don't forget the Thanksgiving service on Tuesday, November 24th at 7 p.m.